Whoops. There we go. All right. So I think this is the time. So uh, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm Devin Stewart. Uh, I, so if you haven't seen my other talk, I talked about guardrail uh, yesterday. And guardrail is a, a, a swagger to open API to Scala and Java code generator. And the biggest thing that it does that I think is the right decision is it attempts to build code using actual proper structures that are uh, related to the language that it's trying to generate. So the biggest thing for me was that we could properly model Scala, not having to worry about any of the idiosyncrasies of escaping or, or proper formatting or anything like that. And Scala has a lot of you know, very esoteric language features as far as, as uh, formatting goes. So as a result, Scala Meta is a tremendously useful tool to, uh, to solve that exact problem. Uh, I've been using Scala Meta now for about two and a half years. Uh, and I can say that uh, learning to use it is probably the most difficult thing, uh, only just because it is not how you normally think about working with code. Um, just out of curiosity, anyone has anyone worked with uh, uh, white box or black box macros in Scala itself? Okay, perfect. This talk is for you. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is, is going to go uh, pr basically go over building arbitrary code blocks using quasi quotes, unpacking those code blocks, and repacking them with different structures. Uh, and so this is. More, the reason that I asked you to all have the Scala Meta uh, library available at your console is because I, I really want people to understand and feel the process of translating these ASTs. So without further ado, let's get started. So uh, import Scala Meta underscore will bring in everything from Scala Meta. Scala Meta has a lot of, uh, a lot of structures and uh, some sort of uh, string extensions so we can do things like Q uh, double quote def foo equals five. And that will give us a definition in Scala Meta. And this definition looks like a normal string. It looks like a Scala function. But if we actually say res zero dot structure, we can actually see the abstract representation of the structure itself. And this comes out as a string. So the default to string for Scala meta objects is to display them as they would be as normal syntax, uh, which turns out to be quite nice because you can then effectively show the syntax of Scala meta objects and then write them directly to files and compile them. This is a very useful technique. So the thing that we do in Guardrail is we actually write whole trees of Scala meta uh, syntax structures. We write all of these trees into the source managed directory uh, inside SBT, and we tell SBT that these managed files are actually something that need to be compiled as part of the uh, as part of the compile phase. So by having these files generated in a structured way, we don't have to worry about oddities of, as I mentioned earlier, odd oddities of Scala syntax. So it, it'll do things like if we say, for instance, um, let's actually take the thing that we just generated, res zero here. Um, actually, yeah. So let's take the syntax that we just wrote in this quasi quote. So this Q uh, quote def foo equals five. Let's stick a val in front of it and actually unpack it from res zero. So all we've done is put a val in front and unpacked res zero. This does nothing because what it's doing is it's effectively using the unapply of all Scala meta, uh, Scala meta structures. And it's unapplying nothing. So it's unapply seek. It's not, we're not getting anything out of this thing. We, all we're doing is saying, I want to unapply the thing that I've just built with this thing. It's effectively like saying, it's, it's the, same, the same thing in Scala. So the difference is, if we say, unpack the, the function name, now we've extracted the function name. This actually is a, a term name. So there are a bunch of different uh, structures, semantic structures of the Scala language that Scala Meta understands. And each one of these have a special purpose and you can't mix and match. Uh, this is as far as the type system goes, as far as Scala Meta is concerned. Scala Meta doesn't understand if you say, for instance, something like, I'm going to define foo to be um, a, a list of integers uh, that is the value five, 
it doesn't know, it doesn't know anything about this. Scala Meta doesn't care about the, the type checker, and it would be nice maybe someday, but it's, it's not really practical for our purposes. Uh, it would require, uh, I think, some extremely gnarly types in order to represent this. Uh, but because Scala Meta is representing Scala, it's technically it's possible to lift Scala Meta into the Scala type system, and it should be, you know, structurally correct in that in that sense. But uh, that's beyond the scope of this talk. If anybody else is interested in that sort of work, uh, let me know because that is also very interesting to me. So if we say body to extract the body of this res zero, we're going to get the the function name as well as the body. Now the term name is foo, and the term itself is five. The term represents the top level of all of the things that you can represent as far as terms go in Scala. So for instance, uh, this term could be, if we flip this around when we generate this, let's actually look at the structure again. So we see that the term name here, foo, and then this literal int, uh, literal int here um, is the equivalent, whoops, I don't need the definition of that, thank you. Uh, if we copy this, we can actually get the exact same structure as we had before. So this, is, this actually shows off another very useful form of iterative development with Scala Meta of representing the, the, the type, uh, the AST structure, copying that structure from the REPL and then starting to change things. So for instance, if we swap this lit int with, I think we can say term name bar, now we have an alias. We've created a function that when it's executed, it will actually refer to this bar, this bar value. It, Scala Meta doesn't know what bar is. Bar doesn't even exist at this point. But by, because term name is a term, it's valid as far as definitions go inside a function. I don't typically build up stuff using these classes, these AST values directly in in day-to-day -day code because I find the code that it generates to be quite unreason uh, unreadable. It's, it's very difficult to manage very large structures this way. But there are useful cases, for instance, uh, if we, what is this nil? This nil on this def, I'm very interested to find out what that is. Let's grab the structure of this. We just stuck a private at the beginning of this thing. So now we have this instead of nil, which is what we had before. Now we have a modifier for this function. The modifier's name is, uh, or rather the, the, the kind of modifier is private and the name inside private is empty string. This is uh, likely a wart in uh, Scala Meta, not being able to represent um, everything. But if we uh, make this a package private for um, like example, we can see that now the private is constrained to example. The structure of names, names there, if we look at the actual, if we look at the structure of terms and types and constructors of Scala Meta's source, you'll see that there is this interrelation of term names, type names, uh, term bodies, literal values, uh, trees, blocks, everything in the Scala language because there are so many overlaps between different structures. A name in the type level might be similar in structure to a name at the term level, but because they are used in different places, it's not possible to say, I'm going to take the, let's say, I'm going to take the, uh, I'm going to take this type name foo here. Uh, so if we grab this type name is foo, if I copy just that, I'm going to grab this, and I try to put that as the term name. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is I'm going to define a private function, but the name of the function is a type name, which is not useful. It's not, it's not, it's not reasonable. So you're going to get 
a, cent or a, a type error because Scala Meta expects things at different places in the quasi quotes. This is a very useful thing because now we get typed, typed construction of our ASTs, our, our syntax as we're building things up. This can guide you towards more useful abstractions and you can, you can find uh, errors at Scala Meta's compile time instead of at your Scala C compile time. So this, this can help you iterate faster as well. Uh, but you, you get a lot of this benefit if you really play around with it at the console. So this is another reason why we're doing this here now. So if we take the simple example again of just def foo equals five, removing the structure, but if we replace foo with term name, uh, let's say foo and then, right, so we'll start with foo just to see whether or not this compiles. It should give us our initial simple example back. Let's instead say uh, one until 10 to list map i is going to be interpolated into this foo. So, whoops. So now what I should get out of this uh, do I need one? We'll see when I run it. Okay, so if we, uh, let's actually, instead of map, let's, uh, yeah, so just to get the, so we can, we can use this, we can start to see how you can use these techniques to start interp or to integrate different data sources in order to build abstractions that you can use to automate boilerplate. So for instance, if I were to take that uh, i until 10, take that i, this is gonna become a little bit messy, so um, let's do another, let's actually do one other thing quickly before that. Let's do a, go back to our simple example of just def foo equals five, but I didn't talk about parameters yet. So if I say a is an int, and I say, first of all, we're gonna get that same structure back out. And then I say structure. We can see that the parameters are represented in functions as list of list of param. So this is because in Scala, you know, you can have multiple parameter lists. And because you have multiple parameter lists, you can actually represent this as a list of list of parameters. So very natural in that respect. If we take this and say, I want to know the parameters of this function that I've just created, let's bind this and extract this from res 14, which is this one right here. This is what we just created. Do you want to just explain a little bit what you're doing on the left? Um, the equal sign? I mean, I think you're yeah, sure. On, on this one? Exactly, yeah, it's, 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 so quasi quotes in Scala Meta are remarkably useful in the way that you can use them to unapply. So because you can build something with Scala Meta and then get a structure back from Scala Meta, so this meta def and def, that def has an unapply. If we can actually look at res 14 unapply, no, it's not res 14 unapply, it's, it's def and def unapply, right? So this will take a def and def in, and it will actually extract out the tuple of this mod, the, the name, the list of parameters, and the list of list of parameters. So this is the type parameters for that function. This is the uh, value parameters for that function. This is the optional return type. And then this is the body of the function. So because we can use that unapply function, we can actually, effectively, we can, we can extract any component out of the structure that we just built. And it will complain if, for instance, if we go back to our initial uh, example of res one, I think. No. Yeah, so it'll, it'll give you a match error, for instance. If you try to unpack something that doesn't structurally match, because it's actually doing the, the, the structural match of, effectively, these are all case classes, right? So if you say, if I'm gonna grab the, 
structure here, and I say this structure, it's a big gnarly structure, I don't want to type any of this stuff, but I've just pasted that same structure twice. I've said unpack this structure from itself, does nothing. But if we instead say I want f name here, it'll actually extract that f name. So this is, you can see that this is structural unpacking of case classes, exactly as you normally would do, nested to whatever degree you want. But you can do this with quasi quotes as well because they map directly to each other. There are certain things that you can represent conveniently in the structure that you can't represent in the quasi quotes due to limitations of the quasi quotes themselves. And I think that these are generally bugs that, you know, maybe someday well, either I'll get around to fixing them or somebody will fix them or whatnot. But for our usage, for like for our purposes, we didn't actually find this to be a, a significant hindrance. Yeah? So when you specify that large def n dot def and you have um, all, uh, all this large definition here and the only thing there that isn't defined is f name, somehow it's actually scanning that just looking for an undefined symbol. Oh, well, yeah, so. Uh, so let's say a int and then case class bar is uh, b is a foo and c is an int. Uh, sorry, no, that's correct, right? So if I say bar foo one two, right? Now I get a bar with a foo inside. If I then take this and say val bar foo and then res sixteen, it'll unpack itself. But if I say this is first and this is second. Now I actually bind those things. So this is how case class working unpacks, uh, case class unpacks works normally in Scala. It's just rare to see it with such complex structures. So this is, yeah, I, think yeah, I, I like the question because it, 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 it really highlights that th there's no magic here. This is really just that Scala meta has an extraordinarily comprehensive system to represent all of Scala syntax in terms of case classes. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, yeah, very good question. So let's go back to uh, just a simple quote of def foo with a as an int is five. So I'm going to grab that. Now, because I have this definition, I'm going to unpack the sequence of parameters from what I just created. So uh, this dot dot dollar sign syntax in Scala Meta unpacks a list of structures. And it maintains the sequence of that list of structures. So if we unpack this, we get a single list of term parameters. And we can see that the only parameter inside is this A annotated with the, the type int. And this is very useful because now we can take the exact same thing that we had before and repack it with these parameters. And we get the exact same structure back. This is the same thing. Structurally, this is the exact same thing as this. And this is very interesting, but it gets more interesting when we remember that Scala has multiple parameter lists. So there's actually a three dotted variant, which unpacks the list of list of parameters. And now you have full control over how many parameter lists you need and also the parameters inside each parameter list. This is amazing. <laughs> this is so, so, so useful. Like, that's not a regular run apply, is it? No, this is, this is actually due to the parser syntax that they put into the string context for the quasi quote. Right, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you end up getting this, this tremendous amount of control. So if we take just this, uh, let's grab params. I'm going to, don't tell anyone I'm doing this. Just grab the first one. Uh, res19 structure to get the structure of the parameter. I'm not watching the clock, by the way, so just give me a sign. Cool, thank you. <laughs> just, I'm having fun. Uh, so the, uh, it, right? So if we take the sequence here, one until 10, and we map that to I, and say um, this is a I, close curly, and let's also to list here. Now we have the sequence of all of these parameters that we've built up until this number. So I'm going to, so I'm using tmux, so you, know, you have to figure out copy-paste in your own terminals. 
Uh, I'm going to go back to what we had before with our one until 10. Um, is everyone who's trying to follow along the terminal okay with this line? Because I'm about to modify it. Giving some time. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, so if I now paste these parameters uh, and then say, instead of overloading I, I'm going to change this to J, uh, to the traditional iterator values. Uh, and then I'm going to bind this to params. And I'll, I'll reformat this line uh, just for clarity uh, once we're done building this. Uh, so my, my function is going to be this uh, term name here. This is foo I. So we're going to have foo 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But actually, we can pack the params into the arguments. And for each one of these functions, we'll get a compiler error. The compiler error is because I am bad with counting brackets. So if we look at params this to that, because I put, of course, I put it here, and I meant to put it down there, which is where I put the other one. So recursive params need types because let's reformat it now because I can't read. So pop open Vim. So let's So now we've got the outer, we've got that, we've got the inner, which is that. We've got this param, which is good. This does not belong there, which is, I think, where this problem was coming from. And this belongs here. So we can see that we've got our outer i until 10, well, 1 until 10, then we've got our inner 1 until 10. And we can actually change this to what I meant to say, which is 1 until i. Uh, and now we see our params. This will end up as a list of param dot, uh, term dot param. We can see this here because this is the structure of this case class. So we're going to get a list of term params. And then we can unpack that into the single parameter list for the first. Uh, and we should actually see that not only does this do what we want, uh, it's actually, even in its current form, somewhat useful, I would say. Because we have the capability of representing, you can see this is start, starting to build towards either some sort of uh, multiple constructor overloading or uh, even instances of type classes or things like this. Where if you needed, for instance, a custom type class instance for all of the, term, uh, all of the tuples, for instance, in Scala, you could build something like this that takes each term and type and applies transformations to it. And so we'll actually build towards that now. So if we, let's, I'm going to take this that is currently here, and I'll, I'll put this in a repo somewhere. But um, if we look at the structure of where we're going to put this thing, because this def by itself, these defs don't live anywhere. But if we take the print line off and get our values, whoops, that's not how that works, paste that, yes. So res25 is a sequence of defs. Now, I don't know what to do with a list of defs. I, I actually can tell you right now, I have not memorized all of Scala Meta, but I have memorized tips and tricks on how to find out where you need things to go. And that's the point of this talk. So if I say object foo with no body, I'm going to get an empty object foo. You can see that it actually automatically removed the parentheses or the curly braces after the object definition because it's empty. No need for them. But I can say, please extract the defens from this empty object. And now we see that we actually got a list of stats. So a stat is a statement. So a statement could be anything like import, uh, class definition, function definition, any of these statements. This is useful. Now, if we wrap this in a 
uh, project com dot example. Okay. Yeah, I want to do this. So yes, yeah, not project. I want package. Thank you. Package com dot example. This won't work because I typed package A. I wanted package. Now, this gives us instead of what we got before, which is an object. Before we even got a def, this one gives us a package. You can see that quasi quotes in their parser are capable of representing different types. So they can actually represent, there's this whole set of types that are representable by each of the different quasi quote prefixes. For instance, param for foo will give you, whoops, a, yeah, no. You can see types definitely don't matter inside uh, Scala Meta. But th these params, this is how to build a literal param. And so you can build param with string interpolation inside these structures. Very good. But because we have this uh, object foo from before, and we pulled out the definitions here, and we'll run this again just to see the definitions again, do we see that uh, def foo is five is a stat? This is a question, the answer is yes. So a function definition is a stat. So we can see in the REPL, we can actually develop intuition of what things are which other things, because I do not expect you to leave this talk understanding the entire tree of all of Scala meta types. But I do expect you to try out different structures. So can we take this uh, param that I typed before? And is that a stat? No, it's not, because a param is not a stat. This is not useful right now because we know what the structure of things are, but it may be useful as you refactor functions. And it turns out that you annotated the, re the return type of something that generates something that is used somewhere. You try to change it because you wanted to refactor, and now you get helpful localized error messages. This is much better than trying to, refl uh, to reflect out at any point in your code uh, what the any value of this, um, I think that the uh, black box macros, there are, it's a lot of any's <laughs> in, in the internal macros. I think Scala Meta offers a, a really curated user experience, which is really fun to write. So we can take our function, or our, uh, let's actually just scroll up to grab the return type of that. So this is res25 is a list of defs. So I can actually take this object foo and put the defens inside that object foo. And we'll see, now we get nothing because I actually bound over that thing. I wanted res25. So now foo contains all of these, which is great. But we wanted, let's say, instead of nil, let's uh, once again come back here and say, private or implicit def foo is five structure to get out just this mod implicit here because that's what I really want. I know that this implicit function definition by itself in isolation is exactly what I want to represent. But if I take that and replace this nil with that and actually let's build this up in a somewhat manageable way by saying I'm going to take, if I'm moving too quickly, please let me know. I'm, I'm switching between two different TMUX windows, which is very jarring. Um, I can also do a vertical split if you'd prefer. Okay, let me do that. That's not gonna be helpful. Eh. Let's do that then. So, So we've got the params on the bottom. We're building up this object. And we can see that by changing what we had before was this def foo. And now we've added this mod implicit. Now, if I paste this, we'll actually get a foo and the, <laughs> the parameters are implicit, which is not what I was trying to do. Uh, I was actually trying to put instead of the mod implicit here, I wanted the implicit to be here, uh, but, which is funny because I actually thought that we were using the, the uh, literal definition here. So let's instead paste one more time and see 
by moving things around, we can get different results, which is what you would expect, but also quite helpful. So uh, I think one other thing that we haven't talked about is uh, with parsing. Um, parsing in Scala Meta is very similar um, to how you do it normally in, in uh, reading in other libraries, but you can read from the file system um, by, I think it's source, yeah, that parse, yeah, so parse will parse a source, which will parse the, yeah, entire, whoa, uh -oh, this is getting, this is getting crazy, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to skip this one because I had actually not planned to talk about that and then it popped into my head that I should tell you how to do that and then I realized that I don't know how to do that. So uh, you're going to have to find that out on your own. But it is possible and it will give you structures. It will do validation for you, which is good. But for now, uh, building up this kind of command line intuition is, is you know, good enough. There is a parsers uh, and you can actually control the, the output um, quoting as well. Um, where we are right now, is this... Is this something that you would feel comfortable implementing or using in your own life? Is this something that, uh, is there something that you would particularly like me to talk about next or should I try and actually write a type class? Foo isn't in scope yet, right? So you have to actually call those methods yet? I will never be able to call these methods okay. because this is entirely inside Scala Meta. So if we take, this might be a good thing as well. So if I take this and I print res39, whoops, print line res39. Sorry, I thought it was in Python. So if I grab this object and then paste that definition, now I have this object foo, and now I can actually call those methods. But the important thing is that Scala meta is entirely a value system. All it is is just giving around the, the Scala, the abstract syntax tree representation of the Scala source. It has no capacity to compile it. Oh, so you have to print it out to a... Yeah, to a file and then run it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is, this is one of the things that on the REPL you can do this. You can just kind of output or you can turn on power mode, access the REPL's interpreter and actually talk to Scala C directly inside SPT. So uh, this is another thing that you can do if you'd like. Yes? Oh, sorry. Uh, so when you're writing a project, we're using this, for instance, to do code generation for, as you said, like tuple stuff. Yes, based. of course. Uh, what's the common workflow to then get this running with an SPT goal so you can get, like, you have your code and they generate your stuff and then, because you might as well be depending on code in your own project within your Scala Maple stuff, right? Yeah, well, the way that we have this currently set up with Guardrail is we have a separate SPT plugin that does all the code generation inside that plugin. We don't actually need to generate code specific for individual services okay. with plugins for themselves. Mm -hmm. But what you could do, I suspect, is install the plugin maybe one level above and if you can inject a, like a, a self-defined plugin in a project above your normal project, and then add that to your sub, like your normal project, and then use that plugin at that point, you'd have this sort of nested structure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so you'd compile the project first, that provides an artifact that you can then consume in a sub project. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. yeah, so that's what I do, yeah. So uh, it's like black box macros and white box macros in Scala? Is that the question? For me, macro generates some code. Yes. So this is, Scala Meta has a mode where you can bind the generated stuff at macro compile time into an object. You can do macro reflection and macro code generation at compile time in order to bypass the entire file on disk phase. Personally, I don't like this. I, uh, I will tell you right now, I, I don't use IntelliJ, I use Vim. So I've never written Scala with IntelliJ and I have no intention to, I find it very confusing. Uh, but as a result of that, uh, I, I find having the files on the file system very important. But this is also uh, a very niche kind of use case. So uh, I, I 
I work with some other people that swear by macros, and they love macros, and they want their macros and everything. Uh, this is not me. So um, it is possible. I don't know how to do it because I've actively avoided it. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, the, the, I think the, the biggest comparison between Scala's white box and black box macros that are built into the compiler and our macro paradise or whatever, and Scala meta, Scala meta is completely freestanding. The important thing is that you can use Scala meta in any project in order to do anything. Uh, I, uh, I'll frequently, I'll spin up something to just write some boilerplate just for a test in the console, copy paste that into a file, compile it, don't like it, delete the whole file. Like it's very easy to do these sort of iterator patterns or iterator like workflows. It's, it's very fast and very efficient. So what you're saying is Scala meta is more efficient when you want to try it out? Um, try it out or, or have long-term maintainable code. Uh, if you look at macros in general, there's this, this sort of wizard community around macros because maintaining the macros is actually quite difficult uh, because you're running inside the compiler and additionally because you, you have the, a lack of type information. So you end up having to reflect much more structure. Whereas Scala Meta actually has a rigorous type system for the interrelated objects. And I find that this actually is another advantage of Scala Meta. Um, no, absolutely no offense to the people who maintain the, the macro stuff. I and mean, that, that has gotten us where we are today. But Scala Meta is an, a complete clean room implementation, from what I can see, of what an ideal representation of a Scala AST looks like. Okay. Yes. Thanks. There was another question. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I guess you're also able to like, uh, modify the, the body of the, the methods, right? Yes. Yeah. So if we, if right now I have this just static five. But for instance, if I say, um, Let's just take the literal of um, lit int of i plus lit int of j. Just as a trivial example, uh, we can actually dump this. And we can see that that doesn't work because there is no j in scope. Oh, because, of course, it doesn't have a j. Now we can at the very least just say lit i. And we can see that the bodies are actually, um, it's a trivial example, but you can see that the bodies actually contain the highest arity, like representation of the function, or minus one. So one is zero elements. Um, and it's an off by one bug in the until here. I think that this should have been a, a two. So. Yeah, there you go. So, <clears throat> yeah, there's that. So, uh, any other questions? Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there any support behind you? Like if you suck the valid X and then you suck another valid X and then it's highlighted, is it magic to fix that little point? Not at all. Text? No, it's, it's, it's effectively, it's, it's the, <coughs> it's the structural representation, it's not text. This is a, a high, uh, a very important distinction to make. Oh, yeah, the variable names themselves are just text, yes. Yeah, and you, you could do some sort of validation for, for uh, name sanitization, or you could have a name generator that, that inside a value, it would generate new names for you until you've gotten to the end of the function. If they're all private and they don't leak, you could do something like that. Yeah. It's far enough to, to see rules, like if you have an identifier that's way too long, it'll choke on it, right? Well, so it'll do stuff like this, right? So if I say um, def term name, this is a weird name for a function, uh, is five. So it'll actually do the back ticks for you. Oh, that's a bad. Yep. Okay. So, um, yep. You're welcome, by the way. I added that. Huh. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. But you can use it. So if I wanted to call this, I could actually say, hey, what's the value of that thing? It's five. So, yeah, if you wanted to, yeah. Uh, we ran into this problem because people were jamming all kinds of weird things in their Swagger specifications. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, avoiding uh, arbitrary restrictions on something that doesn't need to be restricted, yeah. So how, how does it work to develop basically Scala Meta in terms of, I mean, I imagine there is so much shotgun debugging going on where you do some weird stuff where you construct some what basically amounts to kind of AST and then you generate out the code and then you 
throw it to actually Scala C and then everything explodes, like the back case, right? Um, uh, what is it called? So in Guardrail, um, we actually have all of our regression tests are represented as this example case, which is just a sequence of the YAML files that end up getting generated and some other parameters that get generated into the Scala and Java frameworks. So we're actually generating uh, from that, we build the command line args in order to run Guardrail at the command line from inside SPT. And we generate that into an unlinked project in the, pro in the SPT configuration so that I can say at the SPT command line, sample slash compile. Right. Sample is not dependent on by anything. It just exists inside the SPT uh, configuration. So because it's not linked, it's not dependent on by the actual compilation of the main unit. But because I have it in scope, I can very easily define a test suite, which is a Scala test suite, which is run the tests on the main code gen. And then there's a runtime Scala suite, which resets the sample directory, runs the Scala sample. And then for each of the Scala framework supported, it runs that sample slash test. So this is how we actually do this rigorous testing in Guardrail. We actually okay. compile, run, compile, run. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it, it gets quite hairy, but it is possible. And it's actually not a bad thing. This like, actually gets run for every pull request in Guardrail. So okay. it's, it's fast enough. Yeah. I saw another question. No. No? OK, cool. Type class time. So let's take a very simple, to start, um, let's say uh, trait show. Let's just say show tuple, I guess, um, where the type parameters here are going to be the type parameters to the tuples. And then we are going to have the, um, the this is not going to have any instances of that, I guess. This is going to be a, it's just going to do that and say def show uh, for, you know, somebody help me out because I'm looking at how exactly a show uh, type class would work. So like trait show. A1 is def show val1 A1 is, turns into a string uh, just for that single value, right? So uh, if we end up with something like this, we can say implicit object show int. And then we can take, um, I actually don't want that. I want the tuple. So show tuple. This is going to be a tuple of vowels of A1 is going to be a tuple one of A1 by itself. So that, if you provide an instance of that thing, if we say object show tuple, implicit object show tuple, uh, show tuple, I guess int, I don't know, <laughs> show tuple int, and the first value is going to be int, because uh, I, I didn't think I had enough to actually write a real useful type class. So if we say show uh, uh, vals is a tuple one of a lint int, this is now duplicating this. This is going to be really hairy. I don't want this. Do I want this? I think I want this. And then we return string. And we take the. Uh, val a, uh, actually tuple one of a, extract the vals, and then we say a to string, whatever. It's just going to concat all these things together. And also, I've forgotten a show tuple. In. Oh, extends. Yes, of course. Extends show tuple. Cool. No, because I forgot the closing. Cool. So now, if I say implicitly show tuple of int, then I can say show and then a tuple one of hello will give us, oh, because it's not an int, because it needs to be an int. 
because I said it was an int. Excellent. OK, so if we take all of this crap that we just wrote, wow, that's bright, even getting that in the reflection, uh, and grab this one, stick this in here. I'm going to define it down here, and then we will now translate this, the one that worked, actually, into something useful. So we have that, and we have that. So let's take this. Yes, five minutes. Excellent. OK, I might have enough time. So if we take this speed mode uh, and say tparms to uh, extract all the parameters from this thing, so if we actually start with um, our literal and extract the parameters initially. We can see we have a list of parameters, uh, but type parameters. And then we can say our uh, tuple t size is, or our t class for tuple class uh, in my example here. And we say um, this is going to be the same as t params. Um, I think because I, I didn't write this well, but uh, t params one, we'll just extract it and ignore it. Uh, and that gives us a what? Extracts t params, t class, and t params one. Uh, t params and t params one are the same. So I guess in theory, you could actually say they are the same binding. And it, oh, because I needed the backticks, which may be referencing the previous, yeah, okay. So let's just keep that. So now we have this structure, which gives us something close to what I want to generate, but I want to generate it in a, whoops, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, 1 until 22, map, um, actually for each, just to make this easy. So size is going to be uh, trait show tuple, uh, show tuple, and then we're going to need to explicitly say this Actually, we should say one more binding here is going to be um, T class name is going to extract out. Whoa, sorry. The one that I wanted was here. And then we can say T class name extracts that out. And so we can see it's a type name. So we need a type name of show tuple. Uh, size, and that will give us the name there. We can then take the t params. The t params are going to be a list of params. So if we remember, we can say um, one, uh, two, size, to list, map, param. Uh, actually, this might be better to say t params, zero structure to pull out the structure. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to be able to finish this, but we'll write it anyway. Um, so I, and then we can say this is going to be a I, and that's going to be that. So if we take what we've got already, just taking this and saying t params from that, and ignoring the uh, let's just hard code this to tuple 22. Pretend that that is actually correct, and then tprams there. We may actually have something. And then we can say defin is that, and then we print line defin. Nope. <laughs> ah, well. Um, I think that's because I needed a. Let's look at back up here at the type t class is tuple one t params is oh yeah of course t params one dot or zero dot structure is what I actually wanted and this is a type name of that thing so we can take this and say instead of t params we can say this unzip of the first element and the second element of the literal uh, we can actually just take the Type name entirely. 
And I think at the end of this, whether it works or not, it's going to be done. So let's unzip that to tname and tname1. Uh, tname, or oh, t, not tname, sorry. This one is the one that got unzipped. T params and t params1. Go, go, go. You know, live coding always works. So there you go. Ha, 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 ha.